We good? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are just getting started right now. And as always, as I update all the social media, uh, if you would like to put where you're from, where you're watching from, we'll do quick little shout-outs as uh, Joe will say out. Okra says hello from Florida. Dennis Brown is here. He says, hola, amigos. Hey, hello, Dennis. Uh, I think it's Yas Yasya. Hello from Ukraine. Uh, Anna says, good afternoon, loves. Good to see you guys back finally. Mm -hmm. Ricardo says, hello. Hello, Ricardo. Oh, <laughs> my screen just like <laughs> all of a sudden it had like four or five things just like pop up. Oh, uh, something happened upstairs. Yeah, spider. Uh, Renato says hello from Italy as always. Hello, Maria from Denmark. Says hi. Selena from Sweden. QVQ from Poland. Abrar from Toronto. Ralph from Missouri. Kill 100 says hello from Finland. Uh oh. We just we just lost Tim. He'll be back in a second. You're muted. <laughs> this Google Hangout sometime, I swear. <laughs> Did it just crash on you? Yeah. Oh. Uh, no, we're good, though. Sean okay. Diamond says hi from Mars. Hello, from Earth. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Hi, right, you ready to do this, Joe? Yep. Hi. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Von Rieden with the moderator, Joe Chico. Hello. And welcome to our Wednesday CG Cookie 2D Digital Art live streams. And the reason that I am uh, more specific is because if you check out CG Cookie, we just launched 5.0. And with that, we combined all the sites into one. So now it's more of a community of digital art rather than being specifically just Concept Cookie. So from now on, if you hear me talk about 2D digital art, that's what I'm referring to as CG Cookie of what it used to be. But now it's kind of evolved into this 2D digital art. And if you also check out the site, you may notice that, well, two things. Some of the old tutorials, you don't know where to find them. We are currently migrating a lot of them over, but a lot of them can be either found in the library or if you click the Archive tab on the side of the site, that's where you'll see a lot of them. And then uh, you may notice that there are a lot of new ones. So there are, I think as of right now, there's 16 or 17 new tutorials on the 2D digital art side. But those cover more of the fundamentals because we are trying to create an uh, entire path. So a learning flow is what we've been calling them, where you start here, and by the end of the flow, you should have like a full comprehension on 2D digital art. So right now, we only have the basics, lighting, form, and shape. And right now, I'm working on a color one, as well as some technical ones. So even um, I have like five ready to publish, and they're very basic, like what's the difference between RGB and CMYK, things that I think digital artists should know. It's not like absolutely crucial that they know, but I think it's good to at least have the knowledge of what um, things like that are. All right. And uh, as always with our live streams, these aren't going away. So for those of you who are asking when 5.0 comes out, what's going to happen to the live streams, uh, we're going to keep doing them every Wednesday. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of the other sites, maybe not a weekly basis, but maybe like once a month, they'll do a live stream as well. Um, I think those are the big announcements for CG Cookie right now. Just look forward to a lot of the new tutorials coming out. And uh, uh, the community is another big thing that we're trying to promote, where we have a, a big community, but I feel like it's uh, scattered, where like our DeviantArt community has a lot of followers, but they don't even realize that we have a sculpt cookie, where there's a lot of like traditional sculpting. And it's actually really, really good. Uh, Lisa is the tutorial author over there. And if you ever were curious about maybe doing some sculpting, definitely check it out, because I think the more well-rounded artist that you can become, the better 
uh, your specific target. So like if you want to do more 2D digital art, it definitely helps having an understanding and knowledge base in like sculpting or 3D, whatever it might be, to kind of take that knowledge and then apply it to 2D digital art. All right, I'm almost out of breath from talking. I feel like I've been just one really long run-on sentence. So for today, uh, we are going to be drawing crystals. And more or less, uh, it's going to be on like shading and material study. But if you have any questions that aren't specifically even on crystals, maybe about digital art in general or um, getting a job in the industry, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments section. And Joe will go ahead and kind of filter the questions to me, and I will answer it to the best of my ability, if not Joe. Uh, what are the... Oh, really quick. Oh, where's the other one? All right, so I bought... I went to the bookstore with Joe, and um, we found... Uh, some of the Imagine FX, the recent ones, I forgot where I put the pinup one, but there's a, a question I want to ask you guys later in the stream. And if you ever go to the bookstore, definitely give these at least a look through. There are a lot of not only good artists and tips for like obvious, but um, ones that might be inspiring for what you're working on recently. Like even in the sketchbook, uh, I'm, if you don't know who John Thacker is, he actually did a tutorial for Concept Cookie last year. And he's in this book, and he had a concept that I actually found really inspiring, and I kind of want to draw something that is similar to it. Oh, here he is. Where I love the head. I don't know how well you can see this. Uh, the skull that's kind of like engulfing the head, and it's being used as a helmet. And I really like that idea. So if you can't feel, if you feel like you can't get inspired recently, go to your local bookstore. All right. I think I'm done. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Let me switch screens here. We have tons of questions already. See, I really we just started. I know. <laughs> um, we have one in particular that's about gems. Okay, one second. Oh, why won't it switch? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, is it kind of like on the starting for doing gems, or? Uh, it's a question about transparency, and uh, background color. Uh, I'll ask it, and then you can hit it later if, if you get to it. Uh, it says, with gems, you can usually see some of the bit of the background color within it because they're semi-transparent. But I'm having a hard time achieving that level of transparency with my pieces. Any tips? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When we when we get more into the, the shading part, I will definitely talk about that more. But you are absolutely correct. I'm trying to think of what kind of a... I think I'm going to start off with... Um, a crystal, just like a standard crystal, and then work up from there. Let's see here. Let me get my... There we go. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick sketch of outline of a crystal. I'm going to be using a circle hard edge brush for this. Make it a little darker so you guys can see it. A little easier here. Jake Scott asks Joe, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing a lot better than it was last month. <laughs> uh, last month I was in the hospital a lot, so it's good to be back doing the live streams. Uh, Carolina says, hello from Portugal. How, how are both of you? I'm doing swell. I was going to say, you just got a haircut. I did. I love getting a really long fade. <laughs> My girl said I had the thickest hair she's ever played with, so that was kind of uh, interesting and disturbing. <laughs> Uh, Ricardo said, did the live stream begin? I can't see anything. Uh, try refreshing, because I'm pretty sure we're live right now. The live button's on. So we better be live. This has happened before, where we right. talk to ourselves for like a half hour. But I think this is kind of a simple rock patch. Here, let me do some of that. OK, so when drawing crystals, especially a group of them, well, these are specifically like implanted in the ground. 
But what you want to look for is like jaggy edges and having the flow read well where you can still distinguish the crystals from one another, but when we add the color, that's when they'll it'll either become lost in translation or it'll read really well. So you have to be careful about how you place your colors, but I think having a good start, like a good foundation of uh, the forms of the crystal is good to start with. I'm going to go ahead and make a new layer underneath of this, and I'm going to quickly... I'm going to use a soft edge brush for this, actually. And I'll show you how I can go about doing this. And let's make... What color should we use? Uh, let's do purple. I think I haven't drawn anything purple in a long time. So when doing things like this, I want to create a, a form of a gradient from dark to light. And in this case, I'm going to have the tips of the crystals be more saturated with color. I'm going to have a very slight fade gradient where it kind of loses the color near the base. And I'm doing that for two reasons. One, to add interest, but also to add some contrast so that when, let's say, this area, this line here, this edge between the two crystals, uh, this can help pull one crystal in front of the other. So having that slight gradient implies that. And I think I want to add a hint of a light gray or like a light blue gray near the base as well. And remember, this is just the foundation. We're not trying to work up any uh, solid shading yet. You know what? I'm just going to add hints of red. I don't add too much, just a hint. Because I, I also don't want you guys worrying too much about uh, the, the shading and the detailing yet. Because I think having a strong foundation first works so much better in the long run when you're trying to create something. So in this case, I'm not worrying about if I'm staying inside of the lines or anything, because I know I can work with that after. I would rather first focus on my color placement and having it read well from the get-go. All right, so now from here, I'm going to make another new layer. And there's two ways that I could go about doing this. I think I want to do this without using the selection tool, but another great way would be using your polo polygonal lasso tool and like separating the forms from each other, going to your brush and then filling it in. Now I'm going to take more of a traditional sense to it where I'm going to paint it on, but uh, if you're more on like a time efficiency crunch then I would definitely use uh, that kind of a shortcut. Okay, so now for this I'm going to block out these different cuts in the, the rocks themselves. And this is what's going to help. I don't want to, it's a little too dark for what it is. Let me try a little lighter. These cuts indicate different angles that the light is reflecting and bouncing off of them. So this is what will really stand, make the crystals stand out as a crystal themselves. Um, is there any way you can show which direction the light's coming from and then how it's actually going through the crystal? Yes, yeah, so we'll have a front lit crystal. And then I'll show you guys how to round that out. So kind of like what we had in this uh, marketing one. I created this a long time ago as a crystal reference. And you can kind of see that the light source is implied from the front, but it's not like the, there aren't very many highlights. And if there are highlights, they're very, very uh, limited. So in this one, I'm going to be a little more contrasty where I'm going to really let the highlights shine. But for crystals, I think implying a light source is good, but you don't need to be over direct because then when you overthink it, that's when the crystals start to actually feel uh, not as realistic. And if we pull up, let me find... Because one thing you should always do is look for a reference. Find... So I have a few pulled up on the side, but I want to make sure I find one that's purple. That was a perfect one. Wait, hold on, come back. Okay, I really like this one. I'm going to use this as my reference board now. Oh, it's a little blurry. 
find one more. Oh, especially like, oh, this actually kind of is like the fade that I'm talking about. Or how the tip is more saturated. That it has a slight gradient. And do you see the contrast in this top form right here versus that background? Like your interest is definitely being pulled back up to that because of that contrast. So your background color does play a big part, I guess, in anything that you draw. Oh, here's another good one. So then this was another example of like you can tell the light source is coming from overhead, but it's not like overly done. So we want to go for more of that look. Right, let me switch back to my. We got a question in regards to using reference as well. Yeah. It says, uh, what are the rules of working from reference? Can I just use any fo photograph, or do they have to be open stock images? If I want to sell or display a piece, what are the potential legal implications of references? I'm scared to try and sell stuff. Um, okay, so we get this asked a lot in terms of like copyright issue and stuff. Uh, the, the, I guess it's comforting. I'm going to let you guys know. Almost every big, or I guess every digital artist that is in a high industry profile job uses reference. And a lot of them actually use it a lot more riskier than a lot of beginner artists, where they might like even paint over some of the reference image that they'll just pull from Google. So yeah, there is some gray area. There's actually a lot of gray area with that. But I, you don't need to worry too much about using reference that isn't open source. The only thing is, is if you're using reference correctly. So I don't want you to just pull an image from Google and then pull it into your canvas and then paint over or like blend it in. The, the purpose of reference is to look at it, examine, and analyze. Like if you're doing a character, let's say you want a specific pose, you should be looking at that pose and then interpreting it in your own mind and then laying it out on the canvas. So even if it's the exact same pose that you're creating, the fact that you're not just drawing over it in one, and another reason is because that doesn't actually help you in the long run, because then you're taking shortcuts, you're not actually learning from it. But I have never heard of any of the friends that I've made, or even the top artists that I've talked to, get in trouble for using reference, except for um, when they do uh, like slot games, for instance, if they don't do much editing at all, then they can definitely get in trouble, where they have to be pulling from stock images. But if you're just doing your own work, and your own characters and illustrations, and you're using images as reference, then no, you won't get in trouble. So don't don't kill yourself being scared uh, with like, oh, should I be using uh, reference or should, is it like, that kind of a mindset um, is it's not actually how it actually is. So you don't have to be uh, worried about that. Faith Newman asks, I know I'm early, but I was wondering how someone would go or would work towards joining the concept cookie team for the 2D concept section. I was thinking just involve myself in the community and start doing YouTube tutorials. How do I know when I'm good enough? Uh, the, okay, one thing I think no one ever thinks they're reaching that point where they're good enough. Even I feel like there's so much more I can do better, and I, I don't feel like you have a point where you're like, okay, I'm good enough now. I think you reach a point where you feel like, OK, I feel like I'm hitting industry standard, or I'm at a point where I understand enough that I can teach it. So in your case, I would start off on becoming yeah, more involved with the community, start doing YouTube tutorials. And if you really feel strongly about teaching something, then there will be a reaction to it. Because when you uh, are so passionate about teaching something, and you see such a great response from it, that means that you're doing it right. And that you are helping people that are watching your tutorials. So I would definitely say, yeah, get more involved with the community and start uploading your tutorials. Uh, Okra says, so I have a, I have a kind of weird question for you today. How do you fully utilize your sketchbooks? There's times I'll want to do studies and end up just doodling shapes or objects instead, of, instead, and I feel like I'm not utilizing my sketchbook sometimes. Oh, that's interesting, because I feel like if you're drawing, you're definitely utilizing your sketchbook. I don't think, like if you're trying to learn something specific and you're not 
you know, focusing on that, then I don't think you're utilizing it to what you wanted. But the fact that your drawing shows that you're enthusiastic about actually doing work and you're producing work, which is good. But uh, in terms of fully utilizing it, that's a tough question because, like, what do you want to produce from your work, your sketchbook? And if you know the answer, I guess my question would be, why aren't you doing that type of work then? And I, even with my sketchbooks, I feel like some days I have a, I go in with a set drawing that I want to draw, and some days I just go in and I start drawing shapes, like you said. And honestly, usually the times where I just end up, or I go in with not a clear sense or a clear character that I want to draw, I usually create something that is more organic. It, the process is more organic because I'm not limiting myself to a structure that I created before I started. So I don't feel like you're utilizing it wrong. I think that if you want to do specific studies, then make sure that you're doing those studies. But otherwise, the fact that you're drawing is um, exactly what I would ask for if, I, if someone asked me, well, how should I be using my sketchbook? And I would just tell them, well, I actually use it. Don't leave it blank. Yeah, don't leave it blank. That's that's using it wrong. Uh, Jay asks, can you show us how to do glowing crystals? I'm somewhat fascinated with glowing things. <laughs> uh, yeah. How about first I'll I'll finish this one up and then I'll make them I'll make them glow. Justin Miller says, Hello from Florida. Yay, my first time. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Florida watcher. Hope you enjoy the streams. If you're new to the streams, just know you can ask any question you want. It doesn't have to be specific on crystals. Uh, anything, usually we like it pertaining to digital art and something that is uh, more beneficial. But if you have a crazy question, you can definitely ask uh, those as well. Uh, Jacob asks, do you have any videos on how to develop a character? I'm curious to your method on how you approach making an original character. Yes. Actually, we have um, a Creating Characters Where to Start series, and I believe that was migrated over to 5.0, so you should definitely check that out if that is an interest to you. He also asks, what are some good concept design books you would recommend? Oh, man, there's so many. <laughs> I feel like every live stream that we're asked, like, what books would we specifically recommend? I mean, I have, I think, like, 130, where it's really hard for me to say, like, nitpick, like, this one specifically. But in terms of uh, concept design, pretty much any of the art of books uh, will give you a concept design. It, it depends on, like, what subject matter you're interested in, too. So, like, some of the best art of books that I have was... Um, like The Last of Us by Naughty Dog, they had a brilliant uh, display of art in the way that they talked about it and uh, displayed it. I thought it was really great in how they came up with these designs. and uh, That would be more of like a concept, a con conception book, but then if you're looking for more of like illustrations, uh, me and Joe always talk about the Square Enix books and how great those are just purely for like reference. And... Um, a lot of the times, like animation books, those usually have a lot more like in progress sketches and uh, definitely, I would say, more design oriented. And then, then there are just some books that aren't like specific to a video game or a movie that are just specifically on design. And there are a few good ones. I think Joe would know which ones he would prefer over others. Uh, yeah, I mean, like Tim was saying, it it really depends on what you're going for in those books. Um, you can study from all books, so that's that's the good thing. It's just if you're trying to do, like, an educational one. Um, I mean, I always rave about Michael Hampton's design and invention because it's, it's essentially a simplification of how to do 3D form with anatomy. Um, I'll link it in the description for the YouTube page. Uh, that's definitely one of my top for just learning a fundamental of art. Um, but as far as, like, art books go like like Tim said we love Square Enix books they're always so good <laughs> you know the, those armor designs that they do are just phenomenal couldn't agree more <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Chiel says, how would you go about painting something that is stuck inside the crystals if you don't know what I mean? Kind of like the broccoli inside jello pudding in cartons. My <laughs> favorite... <laughs> um, hold on. We actually did something very similar to the... Let me find it really quick. So it was a bug stuck inside amber. <laughs> Jurassic Park style. Exactly. And you have, like, as a kid, I really thought that was real. I was like, oh, we should totally just find a bug in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, this isn't the one with the bug. But this was, uh, let me make it bigger. So I did a live stream. It actually might have been two years ago when I did it, where I specifically put a bug in the middle of the amber. And I guess the biggest tips with something like that is... Uh, one, actually draw the objects. So let's say I don't want to draw a full bug right now. Let me draw something small. Um, what's something small I can put in here really quick? I guess like a rock? <laughs> All right, so imagine um, this rock is an amber. Usually what I like to do is I, I'll draw it out first, and there's a reason for this. Then I'll still add an indication of a light source, but I'm not going to really add in the highlights as strongly as I might is at, if it was outside of the amber because I want it to give the appearance that it's injected into this amber. So right now it should look like it's just kind of like floating on top. It's not really connected to the amber at all. So what you would do then is grab the colors around here. I like to lay it on very, very softly because you could lower the opacity, but I like actually painting over so you don't lose any of the form because sometimes when you just lower the opacity, you can lose some of it. You can see as we kind of layer it on, it becomes more and more submerged into the amber, but it still gives the impression of the rock. So depending on how deep you'd want to get with uh, the amber, uh, you can see when I turn that layer on and off how now it definitely feels submerged in the ember versus just kind of floating on top. And that's why you don't have to really over detail it either because when you add that opacity over the rock, a lot of those smaller details will get lost. So like right now the rock looks like a, like a decent little rock, but when I unhide the layer, you can see how it is very sketchy and very quick. But uh, that would be, I guess, how I would uh, do it more on a quick basis, but if you want to submerge anything in uh, transparent material, definitely draw it out first and then sink it in. And that, I guess that's the way I would go about it. There, you can do it however you feel most comfortable, but I guess that would be the quickest way I can think of off the top of my head here. Okay, so now I'm going to have some fun with this. I'm going to merge these layers down. And put this one on the side. Um, Ralph Do Dozier asks, how do you render caustic ca sticks correctly when the light hits gems, and by extension, when the caustics hit other gems? I can definitely show you that. Yeah. Uh, we had an exercise specifically on gems last year, and that was something I had to like learn and figure out, so I definitely know exactly what you're talking about. So let me show you, this is one way you can use the selection tool, not to color, but to erase the excess. So you literally just use the selection tool, select out the crystal, and then erase, or you can even color it in white, but I would recommend erasing it uh, in case you wanted to add a background, which we, we're definitely going to do, because I want to talk about how you can see through the object. So I would erase it. Um, okay, so really quick, you're asking about the caustics. Let me pull in the gem reference. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the heart gem specifically. So you can see there's a huge difference between this step right here and this step. And literally, the thing that I used was a brush. So it was, let me check the brushes that I have. And you can download this one. So this is a CG Cookie Chaos brush. And this is what it looks like 
It's uh, just very angular, sharp, crazy. And the reason for it is it's supposed to give that random uh, look to the inside cuts of a gem. Now, mind you, you could try to make it look like as perfect as you can. But to be more efficient, let me go ahead and actually see if I can do this really quick. I'm going to select the gray area, inverse it so I'm only painting in the heart. I'm going to choose a multiply. Choose a lighter red there. Actually, no, I'm going to choose overlay. Oops. Choose a darker one. Sometimes it takes some experimenting. I believe I did an overlay and a multiply chaos brush on this, and then I lowered down the opacity. And if in some areas it looks too much, just lower the opacity of that layer. Do this again. It's like right now, obviously, it's way too dark. But when I turn down the opacity, see how we start to get that. So I would keep working on that until I felt comfortable with the underbase, because then it's the highlights that are going to really sell. And in this case, it was more like a jewelry-driven uh, assignment. So like you really wanted to flush out the, the cut edges as if it was like a laser cut or diamond cut, whatever it is, where the gems that we're working on now are more like organic, so it doesn't have to be as like perfectly smooth. But for this case, uh, I definitely wanted it to give that feel. We have a silly question and then uh, a serious question. Uh, let's see the silly question. The silly question is, did you bury the black bird or the black blood bird? I'm going to call him Steven. Did you bury Steven? Oh, my God. That's so funny that you remember that. Uh, yes. Is this? Is, wait, who is this? It's uh, Tijil. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one um, that is sending the feathers. Yeah, thank you for that again. And... Uh, yes, I did bury the bird. Actually, I went out with uh, a pair of uh, these really, really tight-fitting rubber gloves that my roommate had, and I <laughs> I was taking some reference images of it, and it might sound kind of gross, but when I first touched it, like I lifted one of the wings, and the whole body started moving because of how many uh, maggots were in it. I know that sounds really gross, but uh, we I was gone for this past weekend, so I, w I didn't... I wasn't able to take reference pictures of it because I was gone, and then when I got back, it was kind of gross. So I didn't take too many. I took a few. Maybe I'll share them out with you guys. I promise it's not as gross as it sounds. Um, I actually got some cool shots because I, I laid it on a white board first, so it's really, like, silhouetted on the white board. But what was most interesting is the heart of the actual bird was black as well, which I found, like, incredibly interesting. So, yes, the bird has been buried. I have the... Um, my roommate wanted to clean and wash and then um, keep the skull, so we're having that dry right now. And I promise you guys, it's not as uh, creepy as it sounds, or maybe it is. But uh, I was reassured from one of my other art friends in Minnesota who said if we didn't use the bird for study, it would have been a wasted opportunity. So I'm kind of using that as my like, my fallout, my escape coat, as like, oh, no, this isn't that weird. Like, uh, we're using it for study, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you really think about it, the artists back in, like, the 15 and 1600s, they would actually, like, dissect dead bodies to study anatomy and draw it. So I, th I don't think we're going to that extreme yet, you know. I should say, yet. <laughs> can I just say would, you, would you donate your body to, to, to like, anatomy studies? Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, I always saw my body being, like, thrown in an ocean or something, but, yeah, I could see um, me letting it be studied for art. <laughs> and it says, fellow vultures. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, this is a really solid question. It says, do you advise artists who like to do multiple categories of art, like concept art, children's books, graphic designs, adult erotic art, fine art, etc., to use 
slash manage multiple aliases for each one or at least some so it's as not to turn off clients slash burn bridges? This is a great question. And actually, uh, one of the artists I really enjoy, uh, her art, Mel, Purple Kecleon, she does go by um, a second alias, and she does separate her uh, NSFW. I had to, like, sound that out in my head. Her her not safe for work uh, portfolio, she keeps it separate from her the rest of her stuff. I think one, just because she has a lot of younger followers, so she doesn't want her younger followers accidentally, accidentally seeing something that maybe they're not prepared to handle yet, or they're not, they don't understand what's going on. So I definitely think a separation between not safe for work art and your normal art, or not even normal, your safe for work art, is a, a good thing to do. Now, in terms of like uh, the difference between like graphic design and children's book and concept art, I guess that depends on the artist and how you want to be perceived. Where I, I actually don't see any problem with like one image showing more of a cartoony stylized look and then the next one being like a realistic study. I think that shows actually a lot of range. But if you're specifically going for like a job that let's say Pixar or something, and maybe they ask for um, what is the next movie? The Good Dinosaur, where they wanted uh, maybe I'll just I'll, an artist that can draw a multitude of different dinosaurs and show an understanding of lighting and color. And yeah, I think having a portfolio more catered to that is definitely normal. But I wouldn't separate the website itself because then they also want to see how well you do in other uh, fields. And maybe uh, your realistic study will actually capture their attention more than your dinosaur drawing. So I guess that definitely goes from artist to artist. But in terms of your not safer work and regular work, or your safer work, then yeah, I definitely would uh, separate those. <laughs> anyway, really, have... really, 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 really real quick. Okay, right. so front crystal right here and see how it's not as um, sharp. I'm going to quickly just do the selection tool on this one just so that we can bring it up to speed with the rest of them. So can you even see the selection tool on the live stream? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So then I'm just going to take it, and I'm literally going to use my hard edge brush, and I'm going to butt these colors right up to the edge. Okay, now I'm done. Uh, this one has plus 12 votes. It says, have you ever tried to draw your own perfect girlfriend? If yes, can you show us? <laughs> um, I'm going to answer that with a maybe. And no. <laughs> Man, that was upvoted a lot. <laughs> you guys are funny. Um, really quick, I'm going to also inverse the selection, and I'm going to grab this lighter purple to get rid of some of that gradient that was radiating, radiating off of the original crystal. So now when I deselect it, you can see how much sharper it is. In that contrast alone, I feel like all the points of interest are pointing to this front crystal. So I definitely have to be very aware that right now my image is very focused on this front crystal. So to kind of dilute that a little bit, I'm going to sharpen some of the edges on these other crystals and bring the, the slightly darker values down into where it's meeting up with this crystal, just so it's not quite as isolated as it appears right now. And I'll make this on a new layer so you can see what it looks like before and after. Next question? Yes. Oh yeah, sorry. No, that wasn't that wasn't good. Continue. Okay. I didn't know if you were like in the focus Zen state where you're like <laughs> I've got things on my mind. <laughs> um, uh, John asks, forgive me for not checking for myself right now. I'm trying to study, cough, steal, cough, some techniques from the stream kind of closely. But I'm wondering if these streams have somewhere where, they where, they where they're archived for future viewing. Uh, yeah, they're all on our YouTube page. And you can check out all the past live streams that we've done there. And the... Usually we'll put, like, if we talk about anything specific, we'll put links. Actually, starting last week, we did this, where we're going to start putting the links of any of the books that we're talking about, any uh, topic that we're talking about that would link to someone or an artist specifically. We'll put them in the descriptions, too. I would love it if we could actually upload 
like like this PSD so you guys can like dissect it further if you really want to. And I think that's going to be something we'll do down the line when we, because we're eventually going to incorporate live streams, or at least that's the plan right now, into the actual site so that you can comment and share there and you can meet other people of the cookie community there. And uh, from there, you could download the source file. So just know that we're, it's definitely the plan for the future. <laughs> Dave T says, "I was kind of laugh first <laughs> because these are like this. I, I read them because in my head, I'm like imagining how the person's saying it, <laughs> and says, not a fan of math, but the stream is really making me like making making me to like crystals and math, if you know what I mean." <laughs> <laughs> the smiley face. Oh, uh, that was pretty good. I do enjoy puns. If you guys have any puns, feel free to leave them. Actually, it'd be really funny if you, they were more uh, crystal themed as well. That'd be double double points for you. I don't know. That last one was I really was really unclear about it. Really, I thought it was on point. <laughs> we're gonna turn into like this awful humor show. <laughs> we're just really bad jokes. You think we're like really like punny and it, not at all. Ah. Uh. Um, okay, really quick. So the question that uh, was in, and I, I want you guys to answer this, and I was telling Joe where if you want to answer this question, and it's it's just an open discussion. It's not supposed to be like a heated debate or anything. But if you want to answer this question, just put like a Q and then an, uh, an I before you put your statement. And then we'll know that you're specifically trying to answer this question. So the proposed question that was in Imagine FX that actually got a lot of people riled up, and the editor-in-chief even made like a special note of it and did like a section on it. And the question was, do, uh, and this is for both guys and the girls watching the stream, do you feel like female artists are either underrepresented or uh, they're not seen as great as artists as the male counterparts? Now, obviously, the initial reaction will, was, of course, like male and female, like one could be better than the other. It doesn't matter. It just depends on the art. It doesn't matter who made it. Like, it's gender-free. Like, the art speaks for itself. But the second question was one that actually did spark some debate that was uh, more healthy, I guess, where it was, do you feel like they are underrepresented? And do you feel like uh, they used the Marvel example on how Black Widow was the only female and she wasn't really marketed as much as the male counterparts? And do you feel like if a female was in the industry or in that top concept artist position where she could actually concept and design the female superhero or whatever it might be, that uh, it would be more of an accurate, well-depicted representation of what a female superhero should be for a, a female uh, watcher to look up to. So just one of those things where um, I read it and I thought it was really interesting because I didn't even think about it, where I have a lot of female friends that are in the industry and I never thought, like, was there a percentage of guys that have more jobs than girls out of just the people I know? I felt like it was pretty balanced, so it wasn't even an issue in my mind until I read it. So I was curious if you guys feel any similarly. And I think I'm, I was more curious because I want to hear a perspective outside of the states. So I always hear the American perspective, but I want to hear something that is outside of the states as well. Uh, we have questions in regards to uh, the crystal stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and gems. Um, and it's more... Okay, so uh, Dennis actually asked a really good question because I was going to ask this question later on. Uh, it says, in a similar subject, how would you go about rendering ice where the inside is fairly opaque as well as some edges? I see too many ice renders that just look closely to quartz. Are there other effects you would add? Yes. Actually, ice is one of the hardest ones, I think. Well, that and something that is so highly reflective and, like, empty of color, where let me see if I can find an example online, because a lot of it depends on the area that the ice is around. But if you're talking, like, what, are, are you thinking, like, tundra ice, or what are you thinking? Or, like, ice cube? I'm thinking, like, tundra ice, uh, like, ice golem. You know? Oh, okay, that's a little different. Okay, hold on. Giant, sharp... Uh... But then also QVQ says, uh, how do I paint diamonds or clear crystals? 
Okay, so I'm going to pull up two examples here. All right, so this is an example of like ice shards. You can see how it's really playing off of the colors in the environment. So the whites are coming from the light source, so in this case it's most likely the sun, and the blues are either coming from the sky or the water that it's sitting on. Most likely in this case it's the sky. So with something that lacks its own uh, color identity, it pulls from the environment around it. So that's why sometimes with ice and tundra, uh, you get things that definitely border on it looking too gemmy versus looking icy. And it's usually because it's too much color. Where when something's void of color, you don't want to add too much. Like this is an example, I think, of where it looks more gemmy. But this, uh, the title of it was Ice. Where to me, that does look more gem-like. And if you wanted something more ice-like, let me see if I can find a quick example. Um, I'm going to try to find one that actually has color to it. Because ones that are just like more black and white is definitely easy to tell. Oh, OK, here we go. Whereas this one definitely reads more to me as ice. And a lot of that has to do with the coloring on the top, the way it reflects the light. And you can see how uh, it still lacks a saturation to it. Um, I know you guys can't see my color picker right now, but on the, the color picker, it's like half saturated, even in like the most saturated blue area I can find in here. Where in here, it definitely, it's like it's all the way up. It actually can't go any more saturated if it tried. So, uh, if they give an essence that they're glowing, I definitely feel it's more gemmy. But if it is more reflecting, it's more ice. And that there's a huge difference between those. And um, I think if you just do a little research, just type in like ice shards on Google. And if you see some that look like ice, ask yourself why does that look like ice compared to some that look more gemmy to you. And I guess that would be uh, my tidbit on that. But what do you feel about that, Joe? Uh with ice, I mean, that's something that I really need to practice a lot of. I've always liked the the other the gemmy look, but I but I don't know if I like that blue, um, because when it's when it's that much that much blue in the thing, then it look or in the gem, it looks too much like you said, like a sapphire, or, you know, like a like a gem. Whereas I feel like ice is a lot more. Uh, white and then with these crystals that you're doing here you know it's got that tip but it's usually like fr like frosted blue but i mean that's just because the style of concept that i enjoy like uh like the dark siders oh yeah all right what was that oh you know what hold on i can find it really quick uh there was a final fantasy 13 one that i thought was uh really great oh here it is okay um so that the thing you got to remember about ice is it's frozen water. And if you can think about it in a water sense first, I think that is able to diffuse a lot of the color problem that comes with drawing ice shards. Where like this definitely looks more like water, where this definitely feels more like ice shard. So uh, water is more smooth, ice is more rigid and firm. And uh, well, unless if you're doing like what are those, icicles or something? Yeah, icicles where they're more rounded out. Yeah. But you can see how that, let me, hold on. I feel like when I talk about something like this, I need reference to explain it. There it is. Uh, I don't like that one, wait. Oh, man. Uh, look up Shiva Final Fantasy fourteen. Oh, I bet it's baller. Yeah. <laughs> He's usually my favorite summon, if not it for it. All right, so here is the concept for her. You can see how the colors are definitely very desaturated up here, but even this looks a little more rocky. Let me see the actual 3D model. Yeah, even the 3D model feels more rocky. Oh, check this out. Huh? It's a gif. We're getting into this huge debate about what ice looks like. Oh, okay, yeah. That looks more icy. Yeah. Where I think the safest bet is just 
use your saturation uh, carefully and don't oversaturate it. I think there's a point where it, it becomes more gemmy if you oversaturate it and if you don't allow it to be seen through as much because ice usually allows light to pass right through it which in turn allows you to kind of see the environment around it through the ice based on uh, the form that they are. So like icicles are so round that they usually reflect it backwards and then through. But I don't want to get too technical with you guys. Just know that uh, if you want to draw something that is ice shards or tundra, use reference. And use reference that you feel look accurate and portray it accurately. Oh, let me see what you just sent me. Yeah. So this, I think, definitely falls into, like, diamond cut a little bit, but it still gives the impression of, like, frozen, but I still get very gemmy off of this. Mm-hmm. But, like, I mean, yeah, you, it, this is definitely one of those things where using references, you can be your best friend. Okay, so then this is what I've done so far. All right, I'm going to go ahead and smooth out some of these edges, and then we'll get into having light pass through the, the crystals so that we can see the background. So I'll add a background color and everything. I'm just going to smooth out edges so they're not as um, demanding of attention. Use that with my blur tool. Uh, do you want me to start uh, giving some responses to you from the QIs? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Ashley says, I would have to say yes and no. True female artists don't get recognized enough when it comes to bigger project, comp des concept designs for games, etc. But in my own experience, if the artist's gender is unknown, the audience automatically assumes they're female. Oh, really? Ah, huh, that's interesting. Okay. That is interesting. I would say in America... Well, I don't actually, I don't know if this is a country-based thing, or maybe it's just the uh, friends that I have, and when I talk to them, I would say we almost always assume it's a guy. It depends, actually, on, the subject it depends on the subject matter. I would say that yeah. definitely depends on the subject matter. Yeah. Because even my friend Nubia, she is a very, she's a very strong concept artist, but she draws things that are seen as more uh, male-driven, so things like giant orcs and, like... Uh, girls that are very strong looking like powerful female warriors and a lot of the times it's assume, assumed that a guy drew those and I think that really bothers her because she wants to make a point where it doesn't matter if she's a girl or a guy like girls can draw strong uh, strong characters and it doesn't just mean that they're a guy just because they're strong and girls don't have to just draw feminine characters just because they're girls and I, I think that's very true so I don't I don't want like girl viewers thinking that they have to draw soft and feminine. They can definitely draw like strong, bulking guys if they desire to. Ooh, Shauna. Shauna's here. It says definitely feel like female artists aren't discussed or shown as much as male artists. Someone recently noted that even sites like Schoolism have no female instructors. Hmm. That's interesting. You know what's weird is that. Majority of my teachers in art have been female. I know I'm trying to think now. Actually, the ones that really impacted me were all female. Yeah. But I guess then my question would be, does it matter that they're primarily guys? And I guess I would think for you, maybe you'd want to see more of a female perspective on art if you are a female. I guess I maybe it's just because we are guys so that we don't think about it as much. I don't know. It's like I've ne I never, until I read this article, I never really gave it a second thought. I think it's because I'm more interested in the quality of what the person's either teaching me or what they're producing. Same here. But I, I definitely can understand if, the, if females feel like they are underrepresented. Yes. Which, that, that can be a problem. And I think... Um, if you do search them out, like at Spectrum, uh, Joe and uh, my other roommate, Karina, they went to uh, a talk. Actually, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, I talked about her last week. Her name's Carla Ortiz. Go look her up. She's fantastic, and she's an awesome person. Um, but she, like, man, 
she just with her talks and everything she was um she's kind of she's not newer to the scene i don't want to make her sound like she's brand new or anything because she's not but uh she does amazing work and she's a fine artist she's a concept artist uh you know she goes she has her own gallery showings and stuff and um and i look up to her like she she's a role model because i mean she can paint like nobody else you know so i think when it comes to stuff like that like i said before i really i i don't know about like the general public um because a lot of people probably don't know who she is uh but that's the thing is i think people need to be more aware of other artists too you know is that what her talk because i thought it was like primarily about females in the industry no 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 her oh, okay. her talk was about um was like just who she was and how she got to where she was. Okay. It was very it was a very inspiring time. What? Did she ever bring up like the struggles she had as a female artist compared to if she thought if she was a male artist that she wouldn't encounter? Um I think somebody asked a question like that, but again it was answered with like just be better than the boys. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's what I, I always like that, where it's just like, you can kick ass too, just kick ass, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think that was kind of like the the major reaction I had to Imagine FX was just do amazing art, and you'll be recognized regardless of your gender. Okay, so right now I just created a quick green background. I want to do something that was very contrasted to the crystals in front. Uh, I'm going to quickly... Hmm. Here. Blend this out a little better just because it looks a tad sloppy in areas. But then once I do that, then I'll go ahead and start painting the green so you can start seeing through it. But on, so while I'm blending, let's go ahead and answer a few more. Joe, are you still with me? Yeah, I'm reading. Some. Okay. Uh, I just saw one and it disappeared. Oh, it says from from a male pers. Oh, it just disappeared. There it is. It says from a male perspective, it makes sense that you haven't given it much thought. But Joel, the quality of art won't matter if the art that is shown to you is mostly drawn by male artists. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. I think it, where it makes sense that we haven't given it much thought because it's very because we are guys and we we feel represented in the industry because a lot of the people we look up to are male artists. At least that's what I think they're saying. Yeah. But it, I I want you guys to realize like I would say two if not three of my all time favorite artists are female. And I really look up to them. I was going to say. It, like, yeah. it doesn't deter me away from them at all that they're female. If anything, it, it kind of gives a new perspective to it that I appreciate. Because, like, it's just like, look at Lolsh. It's like, oh, yeah. I wish I was that good, <laughs> you know? Like, oh, I don't God. understand color like she does, or even Mel. It's just, you know? Yeah, Mel's color work is amazing. And actually, the number one uh, digital artist in terms of, like, profiting, I guess, that we know about on Patreon is Saki Michin, and she's a female Canadian artist. Uh, Aaron Huggins wants to know, are you doing this, are you doing the start sketch from reference or from imagination? Um, the reference that I pulled up, so hold on, let me pull it up again. So these were the reference that I was working from. So this is actually a good example of working from reference where I'm not like directly copying it. So you can definitely tell I'm using like the gradients that I saw in this one. I'm actually pulling a lot of how I did my original crystals. But then I'm looking at the colors in this, and that's why I picked more of the red hues, and I wanted some of those to shine as well. And when I get to the highlights, I'm going to use this as my reference. Because like Joe said in the beginning, it's important to see the light direction where it's coming from. And with crystals, it's it's a little different than how you would light something 
Uh, normally, it's because you have to be very selective with your highlights, and you want to place them that really, really implies where the light source is coming from. And also, I'm, I'm kind of treating this a little more painterly, so I'm not going for like hyper-realism. Uh, I'm getting lost in these QIs. <laughs> well, this is a good point. I'm uh, glad people are using it, though. Uh, it says, I'm pretty sure concept art entirely is ignored by the average audience. You always hear people like the writers or the sound designers, but concept artists just seem to look over, even though it's such a key stone position. Agreed. It's like one of those things where what you're, when you sit through the, through the, through the staff credits, they're like three fourths of the way through it, and most by the time everyone leaves, right, right when the credits roll. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why. Like, it, it just don't let it bother you. Like, n you'll know how you're impacting the work. You have that sense of pride, and the people that know what you do and how it affects the overall product respect that. So, like, even though the average moviegoer, the average audience member or anything might not, like even my parents I don't really think understand exactly what I do. But I'm okay with that because I don't expect them to understand the art world because they aren't as passionate about this. They don't have an understanding. But like, like even if, if I list out my heroes to like an average person, like any of my cousins that aren't involved with art, which are all of them, they would have no idea. Not one person. I could list out a hundred people. They wouldn't know one. But to me and to the art community, they mean so, so much. And I think that's that's what matters. So it, it, don't let it bother you that the average viewer doesn't understand the art world. And that, yeah, usually concept artists aren't, um, like, put in the spotlight. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, Alan Williams. Yeah, like no? I, no one would know who Alan Williams is in my family, but he's, like, my hero. But, like, and then, but think about all the people at Spectrum that were, like, upset that he wasn't there. Oh, that's actually a really, really good example where, okay, if you guys don't know who Alan, Alan Williams is, here is his name. Go look him up. He's wonderful. He does traditional drawings, and uh, they're very, very good. They're very, very precise, and he specifically works on texture and value. Anyways, he is a very highly respected artist in the art community, and at Spectrum, he couldn't be there because he was battling cancer, and he was currently hooked up to a machine in a hospital, and literally the entire Spectrum convention felt that. They felt that he wasn't there, and then all the artists took a picture uh, for him. There were five sketchbooks that were being handed around uh, to all the dealers there, and everyone got to draw an image for him that would be auctioned off to raise money for his fund, and it was, it was beautiful. Actually... That was one of the proudest moments I had was actually being able to draw in the sketchbook for him and uh, write him a note and how much he has uh, influenced me. And th I, that that was impactful. And I think, I, I know he felt that. So even though the average viewer might not, or the average person might not know who he is, uh, the art community knows who he is. And um, it, it's definitely impactful. It's almost like a little family, you know. That's how I kind of see the art world. Uh, this is a question in regards to gems and okay. crystals. It says, uh, how do you determine the hue shift of an object under particular lighting? Example, a green jade rock with subsurface scattering lit by mostly purple light in a pure white room. Does the hue shift towards the reds or the cyans, or is there no shift? Oh, wait, I'm going to have to read this. Yeah. A, G, a green jade rock with subsurface scattering lit by a mostly purple light in a pure white room. Okay, so it's pretty much a green subject matter being lit by purple. Is the hue shift towards the reds or towards the cyans? You know, that's a good question. You, It really depends on like the intensity of the light, and that's, if that's the only light source in the scene, um, if you ever, can you think of like a, a concert or a rock show? and how the lights, there's like no lights, but then the lights that are on the performers are like red and blue and whatever. So they appear to be like red and blue, but you know in actuality that's not their hue identity. Hold on, let me find an example. So 
So if the the light was oh here here's a good one. Okay, so it's almost like uh, a collage of colors, where like you know these symbols right here are probably not blue, but just the illusion that they're giving is that they are blue, just purely based on lighting. But our eyes recognize that it's in this darkly lit room and that there's blue light, so we don't see it as actually blue. So in your case, with this crystal, there's a good chance that the rock may be primarily purple. And it might look purple, even though the actual hue identity is green. And it kind of depends on uh, the lighting at that point. But if you did have some uh, fill light, then there would still be kind of a green essence to it. And then it would depend on how strong the purple light is in that scene. And that's where that uh, difference of color would be. I'm trying to find another really good example. Oh, here we go. OK. Let me bring it in. <laughs> Sorry. Bless you. Thank you. OK, so the guy on the right here, he's prim almost entirely lit by this red-yellow light. And uh, the hue identity of these pants are probably not red, but it's actually really hard to distinguish. Maybe they're gray. They could be jeans. They could be khakis. But it's really hard to distinguish. So when you're working with colored lights, you got to remember that a lot of the times the true hue identity of that subject matter might be lost in translation. So this is that's probably why you might be a little confused on the the light or like what color the gem would be because it depends on the light. Okay, so I'm going to start filling in the green in the the gem itself. Uh, I'll do maybe I'll just slightly explain what I'm doing, but then we'll get to more questions. But basically, I'm going to keep a lot of the gradient going from the top to the bottom, but I'm going to let a lot of this light green seep up, upwards into the crystal. And a lot of the areas that appear like this blue-white area, I'm going to let that read as more green. And it, it'll give the illusion, the appearance, that uh, the background is being seen through this transparent crystal. And then after that, then we'll do our highlights, and then other uh, crystals will be done. Oh, and if you're wondering, I switched um, to a different basic brush that we offer. It's this angular one. This is what it looks like uh, with just by itself. Uh, my friend Tyler, he works almost primarily primarily with this triangle brush, so I went ahead and created one for CG Cookie. And pretty much it's for cutting into areas without having a soft edge. And you really want like a defined rough edge. And that's why uh, this brush is pretty great. So if, if you want, you can download. Like the, the basic brushes on CG Cookie are free, so anyone can download them. All right, what questions we got? I'm um, reading through the QI still. So, uh, just from the debate uh, between people. Mm. Uh, Shika asks, I just started selling my traditional paintings, and I've been made fun of, of for my cheap prices. I don't know how to properly price my work. Any advice? Yeah. I've, if you're made, being made fun of, uh, that's probably a good indication that you're, you're selling yourself short. Where even I had a friend that was selling prints for $3. I mean, they were smaller prints, but the quality of them were, it justified a higher price. And when you lower the prices so much, you're devaluing not only the work that you put in, but yourself as an artist. And it, it's one of the hardest things, I swear, it's one of the hardest things to price out your own work because what do you price your stuff at? If you go too high, well, then are you seen as like a smug artist that thinks they deserve more just because um, of the quality that they're producing? And then the opposite's true. Then where if you sell too low, then are you seen as more of a joke and your work isn't as quality as it, it might actually be? So in your case, uh, where it's more traditional, 
uh, yes, I would go higher for your prices. You you will always regret going too low, but if someone buys it at too high, then it is more of a it, it's a reflection of you as an artist and the talent and the quality that you're putting out there. And I usually like even when I think of like traditional sketches, I I never want to sell my traditional sketches, but eventually I feel like I will. And uh, if you feel comfortable putting it at a price where you would give away your drawing essentially for that price, then then it becomes uh, more of a, I don't say satisfaction, but it feels good where you feel like, okay, I sold this at this price. I thought I was going a little higher than I wanted, but I feel good knowing that this person appreciated the art so much they were willing to spend that, and I feel good giving it to them because I think they'll take care of that art. So, yeah, it's definitely a, a gray area, but I, I do think that you the worst thing that you could do is undersell yourself, especially in the modern day as an artist. You never want to be selling yourself short. So my advice would be go at least to where you're comfortable with, if not more, and then work from there. This one is plus 19. Oh, geez. It's from Jane Doe. It says, do you have any suggestions for creating detailed backgrounds I've seen amazing concept art on DA, and I've always wondered how they fit so many details like small birds in a faraway tree or cracks. I'm sorry if I'm not making sense. No, it's OK. Uh, a lot of the times for concept art, especially environment concept art, it's, those birds are probably a brush. And a true concept art is worked really, really fast because they're trying to get the concept out as fast as they can to show to their modeler, to their production designer. and. Uh, a lot of the times they're working so fast that their knowledge that they're literally like placing values and lighting so quickly because they have such a deep understanding of it that that's where it becomes really like you can appreciate it so much because you're like wow they they really understand what they're doing because they have to they have to work that fast so in terms of uh, creating detailed backgrounds don't worry about the details from the start worry more about the forms the structure the silhouettes and things that will read at first glance, and then you can focus on the smaller details. Because when you get caught up in trying to detail too soon, that's when you become uh, like so entranced by doing the little minor details that that's when it, your piece will take forever. And uh, trust me, from personal experience, too, trying to do environments when you don't feel comfortable doing them can be time consuming. So watch some tutorials from uh, people that work fast and efficiently and try to pick up like why did they use the selection tool to create the mountain and you can see oh it's because then they can create the silhouette with the jagged edges without having to go in with a brush and like try to clean up all the edges where they were literally able to do it in like 30 seconds if that so I guess that would be my advice for uh, doing detailed backgrounds yeah, I was gonna say a lot of time they use for environments they just use pictures that they've taken around the world too. Yeah. You know, like that's huge. <laughs> that cuts a lot of time out. But it also I mean they're not just like selecting it and then just like copy pasting it. There's a lot more to it than that. But they u they utilize the references that they've taken themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. and don't go on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you are photo bashing, be, I just, what's that? Like, rule of thumb, use your own your own reference if you're doing photo bashing. Uh, Mika asks, have you ever found that you get more support from strangers than you do your on your friends when it comes to your art? Yes. Uh, a <laughs> deeper <laughs> explanation. Um, yeah, I would say I do get I get more support from people I don't even know. And I don't know if it's just because there's that barrier where uh, it's it's such a weird thing where you think like yeah the family and friends that I have would be the most supportive, but I I, I really do believe the opposite's true where I feel the most support from people I don't know. Oh man, uh, Kai Kanaki asks, I would like to start by getting better at drawing before painting, something like Ian McKegg. 
he has such a good anatomy understanding, but I heard him say that he that he has a pretty good visual memory. Do I need visual memory to get better at drawing? Uh, you know, that's something that develops over time. It's not like something that you acquire at one point. It's something that, like, you grow over time. So, yeah, I think having a better visual memory is uh, a great thing to have, but it's something that comes with time and practice and um, experimentation. So, yes, and uh, just know you don't get it at once. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Green says, "Hi Tim Joe, I need advice. I need an advice. I want to be a character concept artist. I know that I need to be fast, but I'm always trying to make a decent line art my traditional roots. Even though final results even even though final result is any way without it." Is that it? Yeah. Uh, okay, to be a character concept artist, um, you, you don't have to have line art. I, I, I don't know how more adamant I could say that. Where even, look at what my crystals look like at first. This was my line art sketch. And then I literally haven't done any line art past that point. And then this is where I'm kind of at right now. So if you feel like you don't feel com comfortable doing line art, uh, I actually just answered someone uh, yesterday that was asking the same thing. Use line art more as a foundation. You're trying to build a structure, and you're focusing more on like the look, the silhouette of what you're creating. But you're not focusing on how sharp or detailed or crisp or the line weighting. Anything that kind of gets involved with line art, you don't have to worry about it because if you're more of a blender, uh, blender. If you're more of a blending artist, then your focus should be more on the actual blending side of things. So if you're spending too much time with the line art, then you're not you're probably not giving enough time to doing your blending or shading, or you're not being more uh, efficient because then you're trying to do both, which you can do both. But if you really do feel like line art is not your forte, you're not going to be doing strong line art, and then the final piece, you don't even see the line art, then why are you spending so much time on the line art? I guess would be my question back to you. And... Uh, if you are more like me in the sense of doing it this way, just trust me, try just blocking it out with simple shapes uh, with your line art and then just start filling it in with color and start shading. Even if it's in grayscale, whatever it might be, uh, just try it this way. All right, really quick. So I have to give the illusion that the, these crystals are transparent, at least near the bottom. So even though it's transparent right here, right here, I, I want to give the impression that there's a back cut to the crystal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lightly, even lighter than that actually, lightly edge it out. And I want to give the illusion that on the other side of this crystal, you can see that, that edge. And you can see I did it here, too. And this is what will eventually give the illusion that this crystal is a transparent. So it's not only making the front side transparent, but also giving the effect that, you know, this object has, you know, solid all the way around. So I'm not only thinking about the front side, but I'm thinking about the back side of the subject matter. Okay, we got about 10 more minutes, so I maybe just start shooting question, questions, and I'll try to answer them as fast as I can. What's the funniest thing you've ever drawn? Um, what was that one random live stream we did where I drew, it was like a Tyrannosaurus Rex handing <laughs> out ice cream in a ice cream car? That was shaped like a asteroid? Yeah, that was a little weird. <laughs> um. Or I used to draw manatees in wagons a lot. I guess that was kind of weird and random. It was like the inside joke of the school. Serenity asks, hello from Germany. I was wondering if you have ever experienced days where you just want to throw your pen far away and don't want to draw at all, even though a deadline is approaching. And how do you deal with those days? 
the worst one I had is I was doing the sci-fi concept of uh, a nano suit, and it was like two years ago. And I remember just being like done. I didn't want to. I didn't even want to work on it. I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to think about it. And it was due that. It, I think it was due the next day. And I remember. Uh, I think I talked to my boss, uh, Wes, who is like the the lead at CG Cookie, and just like explaining to him my frustrations and. Uh, he kind of guided me in a way of being like, uh, well, one, he calmed me down because I was just like, oh, I just I don't want to do this. Like, I can't do it. I don't feel like I'm doing a good job, and I feel like I'm going to disappoint him. And uh, he told me to, like, take a break, go get food, come back with fresh pair of eyes, and see it differently. See it in a light that isn't negative because sometimes when you're spewing so much negative on it, it comes across in your piece, and in, in turn it actually can make you progress slower. So I, I needed that mental shift to look at it in a new light and not hate it and be like, I can do this. I can tackle this. And the attitude did change. Like, I, I finished it that day. I, I didn't even need that extra day. And I, and I felt comfortable handing it off to him. So a lot of the times, it's our perception of it. And you got to make it enjoyable for yourself. I think it was my friend Pui that was talking about how when you're given a subject matter that you don't enjoy, Look at the positives in it. Maybe add colors that you can blend together that you really enjoy blending with. Like even with these crystals, I love blending the this these two colors. These are two of the colors I really like working with. And uh, I know that even though the subject matter, I don't really work with crystals that often. I'm going to make it fun for myself as an artist. So I guess that would be my advice for you. I have no idea how to pronounce this person's name. <laughs> Is that the question? <laughs> but in parentheses, it says psycho juice. Psycho juice? So, so we're, or psycho juice. So we're just going to call this person juice. Okay. It says, now many concept artists, now many concept artists use 3D software to build a shape and then make over, or they overpaint them. What do you yeah. think about this technique? Do you use it? I used to um, when I was more involved with 3D. Yeah, I, I actually think it's a really great way to uh, use reference effectively. I mean, like it's your own reference too, and you can pose it however you want. Um, actually, I'm thinking of doing uh, sculptures of my characters. So when I finally do my my book, when I have to draw them in different poses or whatever, I'm gonna just move the drawing. Or I was even talking to Joe. I'm gonna buy one of those Japanese uh, model dolls or whatever those are where you can pose it, because they're like a foot and a half tall, you can pose it to your liking, and you can put um, whatever lighting you want. So I'm going to have like a little photo room where I can put different lights based on the setting and the light scenario that I'm working with, where I would use that as my reference. I, I totally think creating your own reference is a great way to start off your paintings, because then you feel more involved. You feel more of a connection to it. Yeah, I was going to say, I've recently just picked up Blender, and that's what I did a lot of the time. The reason why I wanted to pick it up was just because so I can go through, take screenshots of just basic forms, and then paint them because I needed to st study basic form lighting more. So mm -hmm. it's definitely something that I, would, I wouldn't tell people to shy away from, you know, because it helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, so this is the before and after. I'd probably want to work more on the right crystals, but I do want to add the highlights before we end the stream off. So this is with it just being the crystals, and then this is with adding a bit more transparency to them. I'm going a little further than I probably normally would with the transparency. I would actually maybe even lighten some of the green work that I did, maybe like there. But uh, when you're trying to make it transparent, don't feel like you have to make every part of the crystal transparent. Sometimes just having a few... Uh, edges be completely clear. We're having the others be more color. Uh, it, it provides more of the aesthetic of transparency rather than um, it being completely transparent. Because then, then we're focusing more on like ice, where there isn't much color. Where this, I wanted the gem to have some hue identity to it still.
Uh, Sir Fluffy, Fluffy Fox asks, simple question, do you like drawing characters with tribal masks? I love how organic and sometimes creepy they can be. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that's right down my alley, actually. Uh, J. Rinaldi asks, I have a question in regards to uh, CG5. I just saw that there are not much lessons slash flows in 2D art, but I'm sure you're planning more. What are your plans for the future of the 2D section? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, this is what almost every other day me and Joe talk about what we're going to be adding more to the site. So right now, by the end of July, there should be a color course ready to watch. And even uh, either this week or early next week, I have five short technical lessons on things that I believe every concept artist should know just from the get-go. And that's what we talked about earlier in the stream of like the difference between RGB and CMYK or what's the difference between a JPEG and a PNG. So those will be up soon. Uh, but the, the path that we're going on right now is I'm going to then, after color, we're going to do materials and textures, and then after that, composition. And then after that, we might take a short break from fundamentals and do more of like just pure concept or even traditional, because I've uh, gotten some requests to do more traditional stuff, and it's, it's actually really nice to see the interest in traditional uh, and it's a good break from doing digital all the time, so I, I think I might delve into that a bit more as well. But yes, a lot more is planned, just no. This is just the, the base of what we have planned so far. And if you want to see something in specific, we would want to know. So like, put in the community, maybe we'll make a post of like, what kind of 2D tutorials would you most want to see? Because sometimes just doing the basics is uh, more mundane. And I, I, I can see where I, even I wouldn't want to be watching just fundamentals all the time. I would want to watch something that's like character illustration piece. And I, I would want to see the process. And I don't want to hear so much about uh, you know, the principles of like why uh, this has more of a cast shadow than this other area. I'd want to hear more about the dynamics of the piece and how you're pulling the storytelling elements into it. So yeah, we definitely want to be doing more than just what we have right now. Oh. Uh, Sedeli says for the ice thing, something to keep in mind is that different structures to the crystals. Quartz is usually kind of foggy with a hexagonal structure. Diamonds are clear and can be cut lots of ways. And ice is usually very foggy and squarish. Hmm. Good tip. Mm -hmm. Uh, Carolina asks, do you have any exercises on the CG Cookie website that tell you what exactly to draw? Because I just waste too much time searching for reference pictures and end up drawing nothing. I know it's stupid, but it's me. I know the basic, the basic shades, etc., but I just don't know what to draw. Hmm. Yeah, we have a few tutorials. I think you should do any of the shape challenges we have to offer. Where we have, have some structure, but I do want you to pull from your creativity and like your source material a little bit. Because I don't want to just tell you what to draw and then you are like a photocopy machine and you just draw exactly what you see or what you're given. I do want you to explore your own creativity a little bit. But if you want something that is more specific, like draw this, um, one of the first exercises, I believe, was the female headshot. And that one was like a direct, here's your reference. Try your best to recreate it. Uh, there's another one where it was drawing the eye. So I actually recommend that you take a picture of your own eye so you're creating your own reference. But maybe try that one instead, actually, where uh, you're, you're creating your own reference and then you're drawing from that. And I think maybe, hopefully, you'll enjoy that process of like, oh, I can create my own reference to draw from and then work from that. Even with like doing anatomy, I actually recommend to every artist to take pictures of themselves. And if they're, they really need an arm in a certain position or like holding a gun or something, 
have a friend or even if you can't take yourself, do it yourself. But if you need help, take, you know, get help. And just like grab, go find, um, we have like those airsoft guns, so it's a fake one, but uh, you can hold it and it still gives the representation of holding a gun. And then take it at whatever angle that you want the hand to be holding it, the arm length, whatever, and even the position of the camera. Like you can direct everything, which is awesome. Uh, and then use that as your reference. Uh, I got about three minutes. <laughs> okay. So uh, I would. I'm guessing you're gonna want to do your final look through. Uh, yeah. Let me actually, Joe. If you do, then if you need to go, I'll just do the final look through. I don't know if that if that cuts the call though. Oh yeah, maybe just mute yourself and then um, put it on the side. And I'll just do a quick ping to you when to when to cut it. Okay, so then these are my crystals. Let me show you what it looks like before and after the highlights. Uh, when doing the highlights, use reference, and even this, I would want it to be a little more clean. Where even like this top one here, oops, I want it to be a hundred percent the same color to really give the impression that it's reflecting the light from a single cut. Maybe something like that. But I'd want a few more of those in different places. Because with just one, it actually looks a bit out of place. Maybe I'll just take it out. Now, mind you, if you like the aesthetic of how it looked before the highlights, this isn't wrong either. There's a lot of concept art where they try to avoid using pure white or pure black. And I, I go back and forth on if I like the aesthetic better without highlights or without that realism touch. Sometimes this reads more painterly without it, and then when you add highlights, sometimes it takes some of that painterly look away. So don't feel like it's absolutely necessary that you have that realism touch. Okay, so really quick, I'm going to do my last run-throughs here. Okay, QI. So for the topic that we were talking about today, as a female artist, unfortunately I have to say yes. Art speaks for itself, sure, but women usually take a backseat to male artists, especially in certain genres. You don't really notice it until you actually start looking at names behind the art, though. Another one says, I don't have any experience in the professional field, so I can't say anything in regards to that. In terms of social media, though, I follow both men and women alike whose skills as an artist are about the same. So it seems balanced to me. And maybe that's how I feel, too, just because I haven't really looked into it. I, I take it more as just a surface value thing. And that's why I was curious to hear what you guys um, had to say. Uh, <laughs> from Micah or Mika, have you have people ever looked down at you for being an artist? Yeah, of course. I it's like one of those horrible stigmatisms about being an artist that it won't go away until you start making money, until you start proving to people that this industry is lucrative, like you can actually make a living out of it. That's when they're like, oh, okay, like that whole stereotype of being an artist isn't true for everyone. Like it. Or it's, it may be not true at all. It, it is hard to find work, admittedly, but I will say for the artists that I, the art friends that I do have, almost all of them are working in a career that they are creating art and they're they are making money, and it's um, it is doable. Like I, I don't want you guys to feel like uh, it's something that's not plausible. Uh, speaking of crystals, do you watch Steven Universe? I haven't yet, but I plan to just because of the popularity and when I go to conventions, I see so many cosplayers and Purple Kecleon is such a big fan that I feel like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, okay, I'm just reading through. There's a lot of them. Thank you, guys. Um, a quick question on from Sarah. How can you add highlights without making the surface seem plastic, like skin, for example? Uh, my, my best advice is add very limited amount, if any amount of highlights. Like maybe some on the nose, if that. But usually subtle variations in skin tones uh, are better than like uh, extreme contrast of like light and dark. And especially when you're trying to avoid the plastic look, having a lot of like isolated 
highlights make it appear shiny, like very, very shiny, which gives the appearance of plastic, so you want to avoid that. Um, from Jason, how do you use your imagination while drawing and stop using references? Uh, I would say you you don't ever. I think there's a point where you can draw without the use of reference and still feel like your work is hitting quality, but you're still pulling from the knowledge that you acquired from drawing references in the past. So I think I always think it's better to draw with reference, but uh, you don't don't feel like there's a point where you can just be free from it. And don't seem as a burden, but in like the opposite where they're more of a tool to help you. Um. <laughs> oh man, there's some funny ones in here. Uh, no, red is not my ultimate girlfriend attempt. All right, here's a good question that I think is for, uh, maybe speaks to a lot of artists. Hi, I would know that what are some good tips for artists who have extreme social anxiety? It's easier for me to interact a little more behind screen than in person. However, even my presence online is low. I sometimes wish I could have more personality in both. Uh, this is a great question because I think artists have that where they are naturally uh, isolated and that's usually why they're drawing so much is because they're not involved with um, hanging out with other people or sports or whatever it might be that they're by themselves a lot. And I even read this article about do artists have to be alone to create uh, great work? And it kind of talked about how uh, everything else that isn't drawing can be seen as a distraction. and uh, it was about finding that balance between having that social interaction to, one, not feel lonely, because there's a big difference between feeling alone and lonely, but two, making time to draw and still having that uh, social presence around you, because both are important. And if you feel like you're not having that big of an online presence, then... Mm, Make it an online presence. So go out, upload your work. Whenever you draw, make sure you upload it. I, I talk to too many artists that feel nervous about uploading their work that isn't as good or that they, they know isn't quite the industry standard, and that's okay. If anything, usually people that hire, like let's say I was looking through a portfolio and I was given your DeviantArt account to look through your work, I'm going to look not only through your, your new stuff, but I'm going to look through the stuff you did three years ago and two years ago and one year ago. And I'm going to be looking at your growth potential because I would personally want to hire someone that I felt had more of a growth potential than someone that only showed me like four images that they did in the past like three weeks. And even if it's really great work, like obviously that'll play into it because good work, great work will always uh, be hired. But when you give me, let's say, the four pieces of work and maybe they were like okay, but then another artist gave me their work, and their, their new work is on, like, the same level. But a year ago, it was, like, not even close to where it is now. I would probably hire that person just because I saw the growth, and I see the potential. And I would hire them in hopes that they would continue down that path. Okay, there are a lot of questions, and I'm not going to be able to get to them, unfortunately. <laughs> there, I actually can't even keep scrolling down right now because there's so many. So I'm going to try to just find three more and then we're going to cut this off. So thank you guys again for coming to this. Let's see here. You guys have some funny questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so someone's asking, did you all leave links or descriptions of the books and others that have been mentioned in recent videos? Yeah, last week I put 
in the YouTube video and the DeviantArt uh, journal page on what we talked about and the links to them in the artists. And I will do the same for this one, even though we didn't talk about too much. Maybe I'll put the Imagine FX in there and then links to Alan Williams. Um, oh, someone's asking about CG Cookie 5. Yeah, it's definitely a little different, a lot of different, I would say. But if you go on there and feel familiar with it, it's definitely a great site that we're going to keep building upon. But uh, if I were you, um, I would actually recommend everyone that's watching this right now to upload some of their stuff to the gallery. I just uploaded a few this morning, but uh, I, I definitely look through the gallery, and I pick um, staff favorites. And it uh, definitely gives an opportunity for those of you who want uh, more recognition to be seen. So the people, that, what I was just talking about, uploading your work, upload it to the CG Cookie Gallery. And especially if they were from a tutorial that you did, definitely upload it. Okay, I think we're going to end it there. So there are more about the, the, the discussion about male and female artists. And I guess just to end that one off, I think I, I will do more research on it because it, I do feel so unfamiliar with it that I was very curious to hear what you guys had to say. But I, I do feel like a lot of the female viewers feel like, yes, they are not as uh, rel prevalent as they are as the male artists you hear about and you see. So maybe I'll do more research on that and um, get more of an understanding on that. But I just want you guys to know, I do feel like you can create art and be recognized regardless of your gender. And if we want to go down, if like that's the belief we want to believe, we have to see it uh, from the female artists. So keep rocking uh, the female artists that are watching this. Keep creating awesome work. And don't feel like you just have to, because this was something that my friend Nubi always said on how female artists tend to draw either really cute or feminine things. But if you want to draw those like robust, big, bulky, beefy, strong characters, don't feel like uh, you can't, because there's no reason you can't. There's nothing holding you back. All right, so we're going to cut this live stream off. I want to thank you guys for coming to this live stream today. We do these every Wednesday, remember, at 2 p.m. Central Time. And uh, next week, we will probably do something traditional. We'll see. But just know we'll put the links of what we talked about in the description. And yeah, as always, thanks again for coming, guys. I, I look forward to continue doing these now that 5.0 is out and about. So OK, take care, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.